This video contains spoilers for Rain World Downpour. From the moment Spearmaster passes through the gate to Five Pebbles' facility, from the earliest moment we bear witness to in Red World's timeline, the story is already over. The Ancients had a story, and they built the Iterators to continue that story, but by the time the first Slugcat arrives on the scene, it's all history. The world the Ancients left behind is not a dead world, but it is a stagnant one. Nothing new has been built in aeons, and all that's left is slowly crumbling over the cycles, the legacy of the Ancients rotting away along with their cities. Overtaken by creatures who merely survive rather than thrive, stuck in their animalistic ways. Maybe they have their own stories, but they're mere footnotes in the bigger picture of things. Even the iterators are long past the point of serving their original purposes, only continuing to seek a solution to the great problem because they're literally programmed to. And even then, it's not like they have anything better to do with the nine infinite time they've been given. One has to wonder whether Reviving Moon is an act of charity or if it's an act of cruelty. But much like the slug cats, the iterators don't really have stories either. The Downpour expansion is structured in an interesting way. Two pairs of slug cats topped off by the fifth and final campaign at the end, and each of those pairs share a common motivation. Gourmand and Artificer are their own little anecdotes, one a tale of exploration and life, the other a tale of death and revenge, the yin and the yang. The second pair, Rivulet and Spearmaster, have no stories of their own, but they have missions. Missions given by iterators involving iterators. The first, a story of sacrifice and revival. The second, a tragedy of selfishness and collapse. Again, opposites, and interestingly, again, the darker story belongs to the Slug Cat from the past, from hundreds, possibly even thousands of cycles before Rainworld's original storyline, suggesting that maybe the world is moving towards a brighter future. Because Rainworld, at its core, has always been a story about its world, seeing how it changes over time, learning how the world got to the state that we see it in, how a world, a society capable of feats far beyond what humanity has ever dreamed of accomplishing, became a desolate wasteland devoid of all but the scraps of life they left behind. Spearmaster's desperate attempt to calm a raging god, Artificer's revenge for what was taken from it, Hunter's mission of revival and its unfortunate demise, Gourmand's expedition to scout out new land for its fellow slugs cats, survivors journeying to find a way back to its family, and monks journeying to find its lost sibling, Rivulet's quest to fulfill Five Pebbles' last wish and reunite the two decaying gods. In the grand scheme of the world at large, none of it ever really mattered. Saint's campaign begins with, well, a literal cold open. Saint alone and freezing in the midst of a harsh blizzard, and the player equally thrown for a loop by the unfamiliar atmosphere and even the likely unfamiliar location. It's the same kind of unfamiliarity, the same feeling of isolation that you haven't really felt since your very first playthrough. You don't know the rules, you don't know the world, you don't even know where you're supposed to be going. All you know is that you need to go now. Your life depends on it. And in no time at all, you're given something familiar to latch onto, with the recognition that you find yourself in a snowed over sky island, rather close to an echo at that. Oh, and you slept at a shelter, but your karma stuck it too. You can't even leave sky islands, er, sorry, windswept spires, until you visit that echo, so you might as well book it on over there before the storm comes again. The 
echoes have been changed by the passage of time. Once weighed down by their past, tied to the lands they could never quite let go of, now seeing the end coming for everything they ever built, everything they've ever known, and seeing a future beyond it. Their civilization lost to time, much like the countless others that came before them, much like the countless others that will come after them. You don't have time to dwell on that. It's time to move on. With its karma rays, Saint can now go to either Chimney Canopy or Farmer Rays, which both have echoes to visit, or to Pipe Yard, which doesn't. And Farmer Rays' echo is pretty far from the Sky Islands Gate, whereas Chimney's is right there, so. view from the top of the world, a perch to watch it all freeze over in endless white. Maybe 19 Spades finds beauty in that, and maybe they find tragedy. Whatever, we've got enough karma to go to the wall now, and climbing it should be a piece of cake with Saints to- Oh, it's- it's gone. Five Pebbles is- gone. And then it clicks. Everything you've seen up till now, it's all a chain reaction, rippling out from... From a rivulet dripping into the stream of time. From Pebble's last act of charity. It's a direct consequence of something you did. The only consequence, even. The only time the world has ever changed the response to the player's actions. Saint's campaign is a story of consequences, then. And god, do they set up this moment so damn well! Anyone with enough map and game knowledge is more than likely going to follow this same starting path, and anyone who's played enough campaigns to unlock Saints almost certainly has that knowledge built up. It feels so natural, and yet it's all been carefully calculated, inadvertently set up years and years before Downpour was even a twinkle in Video Cult's eye. But okay, what now? I don't know, might as well go see Moon, right? I always like to visit her first in each campaign, it just feels better than going straight to Pebbles. And hey, she's pretty close to the Shaded Gate too, I can visit that echo while I'm there. Can't get in the Shaded from Industrial yet anyways, so... What stands out the most about Saints Campaign is how fundamentally different it is, simply by a change of weather. At first, you might think of the lack of rain as a boon, and no hard time limit on how long you can survive a cycle, cause I mean, the rain is basically just a kill screen after all. But for Saints, there's no timer per se, just a meter to tell you how close you are to freezing to death. If you can stay warm, a cycle can go on as long as you want it to. But then, it turns out, not having any indication for how long you have ends up introducing an element of uncertainty, an element of anxiety even. You don't have a deadline until you're, well, dead. It can just creep up on you. You don't know exactly when the blizzard will come, you don't know exactly how much heat you lose just by crossing an open room or swimming through a patch of cold water. It tosses out all the old rules and forces you to learn new ones. You learned how a slug cat survives in a rainy world, but that hasn't prepared you for a snowy world, now has it? But over time, the longer the campaign goes on, you do learn learn those rules, learn to keep a lantern on you at all times, or ideally inside you, learn how to move as saint to cross rooms faster and avoid creatures more easily, learn to avoid the open air and water as much as possible, get a feel for how long you have before the blizzard comes and how best to keep yourself warm when it does, you learn to adapt, you learn how to be a slug hat all over again, you learn how to be saint, just like how you had to learn how to be a survivor or hunter or gourmand, artificer, etc, and you inevitably grow attached to saint in the process.
Playing through Rainworld, it's hard not to get attached to the Slugcats. I mean, look at them. How could you not love that? And you'll likely get attached to the Iterators too, especially after Rivulet and Spearmaster's double dose of emotional violence. But more subtly, playing Rainworld gets you attached to, well, the world. The lifeless industrial expanses and the rotting wastelands that have become your home. Exploring them, learning how to survive in them, learning how to be comfortable in them. And it's especially true for a lore hunter like me. God, I crossed garbage waste so many times doing Pearl Runs. So seeing it like this so so far removed from the garbage waste I know is heartbreaking in a sense, but also kind of heartwarming too. The water's become so pure and blue in the time since we last saw it, in the time since, well, Pebble ceased dumping his rod all over it. Hell, the rod is gone, the mobile assists that used to patrol the lower waste are nowhere to be seen. The world is far removed from the one I'm familiar with, but perhaps it's transforming into something better. And then trudging back into unfamiliar territory, there's an echo here? And not a jetfish in sight, either. Sand's gotta swim through that freezing cold ocean all by itself. Well, better move fast then, and stay out of the water as much as possible, too. The upper path of shade is probably my best bet here, so... Wait, that's new. Okay, scratch that. I gotta know where this leads. Oh. Oh. I mean, he had to fall somewhere, right? But what happened to Shaded then? Well, it's not like I can go here yet. Let's just go visit Moon and find that Echo first. Then I'll come back and, er, explore Pebbles, the Rat, some secret third thing? Anyways. Even Moon is acting unusual, unusually cryptic, urging you forward. What was once a dead end for every slugcat before has become a pathway for Saint. And at the end of that pathway, past the crumbled, snowed over ruins of Moon City, we find... Echo who really cuts to the core of it, huh? As an observer of the world, we can only really witness the aftermath of what the ancients built, but this Echo was there. They helped build these great structures you spent so much time clamoring about, and they've spent an eternity watching it all crumble. Watching everything they know and love fade away. Watching the iterators and their cities meant to stand as an eternal testament to the ancients' presence collapse. Gigantic supercomputers reduced to naught but metaphorical paperweights rusting in a frozen ocean. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair indeed. <sighs> Anyways, heading back to Moon after that, wherein she acts like she's never seen you before. One has to wonder if the otherworldly presence of an Echo has an effect on even all-powerful supercomputers. Hmm, let's shove that thought from now anyways. Since Moon's response to Saint's presence is pity, she seems to know deep down in her circuits that there's no real future for Saint here. No real future for Slugcats. No real future for herself. Cause, I mean, she's in a kind of pitiful situation too. The rarefaction still reinstalled in her heart, she's as powerful as she's ever ever gonna get, and yet, thousands upon thousands of cycles later, she's done, well, nothing. Nothing of all the time she's been given, because there's really nothing to do. She's far outlived her purpose, and she knows it. All we can really do is leave her to continue whatever she's doing with her time now. And, I mean, we've got another dead god to visit, so, well, no time like the present. Thank you.
Silent Construct is probably the bleakest drain world ever gets. There's just so much to chew on here. Like, for one, there's just the plain and simple fact that we are basically exploring the mechanical corpse of a city-sized supercomputer. Not only that, but when we saw both at its prime, for the most part, and also as it was in the process of dying. Rooms that were once so full of life, of the flickering of lights, the fluttering of neuron flies, even the slithering of mobile rot cysts, now all but devoid of it, save for those few scattered pieces of machinery still emanating precious heat. Some are still recognizable, others not so much, either gone outright or so crushed, torn apart, or rotted over that they feel completely alien. Even Pebble's heart, once the last thing keeping that superstructure alive and active, is now cold and silent, long past serving its purpose. So why not give it a new purpose then? A scavenger's taken up refuge in it. I mean, hey, it's great shelter from the storm, right? Which, there's something quietly beautiful about that, isn't there? Like, sure, the superstructure is no longer active in the way we're familiar with, but it's still teeming with life, perhaps more so than ever. Lizards, scavengers, spiders, centipedes, hell, even vultures, myros birds, and the poor little lantern mice. It's no longer some isolated structure far above the clouds, it's another part of the environment, another part of the ecosystem. When a corpse rots away, it becomes fertile soil for new life, you know? A transformation into something new. Speaking of the local wildlife, it's interesting, let's say, to catalog the creatures still present in this frozen wasteland, and which creatures are no longer present, which creatures have gone extinct, unable to adapt to the new climate and its new threats. The lizards, for example, some of them are thriving. Yellow lizards are everywhere. Turns out being communal is a great strategy for survival in the cold. And caramel cyans and whites aren't doing half bad either. Moles and eels still exist in their usual spots. There's a few places where blue lizards thrive, and even some red lizards have started to resurface after going dormant post Gormon's time. And there's even a new type of lizard, the strawberry, not naturally seen before Saint's time. But wait. No green lizards, no pink lizards, hell, no salamanders, save for apparently pre-cycles, which don't occur in Saints campaign, so... It's just kinda sad to think about how some of the creatures we've grown so familiar with, maybe even attached to, just are no longer around. Yeah, they've probably just evolved into other types of lizards, greens into caramels, pinks into yellows, salamanders into eels, but that's still, you know, several species that have gone extinct. And of course, there's lots of other familiar creatures affected by the changes in the world around them. For one, plant life is almost entirely extinct, mostly confined to dank, humid underground areas. Lots of the more fragile insect species have all but vanished. Squid catas, dropwigs, egg bugs, even the mother spiders and their hordes of coluscopedes. The swarms of red leeches that once infested the surface of garbage waste self froze to death in the frigid water, and only their stronger blue counterparts survive underground. Likewise, the jetfish could not survive in the vast opening spaces of frigid coasts. It's not just the world that's changed, the life that inhabits it has too. And circling back to where this discussion started, the rot. What a pitiful fate it's met. What used to be a nigh unkillable terror that every living thing feared, a force so powerful it brought a god to his knees, is reduced to two lonely cysts tucked away in an obscure corner of the silent construct. Two blind, deaf, meager blobs aimlessly, desperately wanting to try and find any source of sustenance, and failing. There's no future for the rot. The new world sprouting out of the old world's remains has no place for it, and I don't think anyone is crying for its sake. Anyways, what were we doing? Oh, right. I mean, if we're already talking about beings the new world has no place for... Five Pebbles entire story is like a classic Shakespearean tragedy. Once the most powerful being in the entire game, an imposing figure that looms in the background of some regions and quite literally overshadows others, yet stuck in his own endless cycle with no escape in sight. And in his search for a way out, he ends up not only nearly killing the one person who cares about him the most, not only inflicts harm upon himself and devastates the environment around him in the process, but ends up with the worst possible fate because of it.
stranded alone in the wreckage of his superstructure, endlessly battered by an unceasing blizzard, unable to move or do much of anything, hell, barely able to even think, where the only thing keeping him company is a solitary song, a recording played so many times it's become faded and glitchy, and worst of all, alive, eternally alive. Death, the only thing he's ever wanted, the one thing he sought, the one thing he sacrificed so much for, is the one thing he's been forever denied. And it's not like you can do anything for him. You can pity him, but that's not gonna do either of you any good at this point. The most you can do is keep him company for what little time the blizzard permits. And then you move on. Because you must move on. Because you have the ability to, and Pebbles doesn't. But on we must go, to find the echo we seek. Past the hordes of Myros birds, past the vast expanse of the freezing sea, as the blizzard seems to intensify faster than ever at the fringes of the facility. Up the remains of the lake, still standing tall even without the structure that once to the top of it. This Echo's monologue is probably the most cryptic of all of Saints Echoes, probably because it's foreshadowing of events that have yet to come and have already come to pass. While I give you a moment to chew on what that could possibly mean, I want to take a trip to a parallel universe, where at the very start of the campaign, Saint takes a different path. Instead of heading to Chimney, they go to Farmer Ray's, meet the Echo there, and visit one of the remaining two Echoes we've yet to meet after that to get their karma up to five so they can enter Shaded from the Industrial Gate. Or if they're particularly savvy, up to four and enter from Garbage Wastes. Either way, it doesn't really matter because the end result's basically the same. Stepping into Shaded, or Frosted Cathedral, and nothing much appears out of the ordinary, yet anyways. But the first sign that something's off is that name change. Remember, this player hasn't got the chimney, hasn't seen the absence of pebbles, isn't aware of any of that. So the player asks, where the heck did the shade go then? Wasn't it cast by pebbles? And no matter what path you take, you're given just enough time to chew on that thought before... Oh. The pieces finally fall into place. Pebbles fell onto Shaded. God, the build-up and payoff to Silent Construct is just phenomenal. No matter which path you take, no matter which side you enter from, no matter how much knowledge you've gleaned ahead of time, you're still never quite gonna be ready when that moment hits you. And there's no way around visiting Silent Construct. You have to go here for the Echo. You have to face the consequences of your earlier actions. The Donport team really knew what the hell they were doing with this one, man. And for as much as the world has changed, for as unfamiliar as it's become, the one thing that stayed mostly the same was the geography, the actual physical world. The old names we've known have long been forgotten, replaced with the new name Saint gives its region it visits, but they're also recognizably the same places we know and love. Sky Islands is now windswept spires, but it's still physically Sky Islands. Solitary Towers is still chimney, Glacial Wasteland is still garbage. No, not that way, though God is it rougher than usual, so... Frigid Coast is still mostly shoreline. Hell, even Solid Contract is still mostly recognizable as a mishmash of shaded, the exterior, and pebbles. But it's not all of those. It's it's not all of Shaded, especially. Pretty much everything east of the leftmost third of the region is gone, for good. Crushed to rubble. You can't go back to it, ever again. All that really remains of it are whatever creatures managed to survive the fall. The spiders, of course, the lantern mice, the Myros birds, hell, even the yellow lizards that fell from the underhang into memory crypts. But the land, the structures, the ancient burial grounds, gone. It's an explicit absence of something that used to be there. Much like with the extinct creatures, just at a larger, more concrete scale. It's it's just sad, you know? Yeah, the world the ancients built is crumbling, has been crumbling for centuries, millennia even, but you've never really had to face that reality up until now. And Shaded's absence is a simple and blunt reminder of that fact, that it's sullen permanent. permanent.
everything Saint just crossed, every structure, every tower, every tunnel, it's all going to be gone someday. Maybe it'll happen so far off in the future that nothing will be left to witness this collapse. Maybe it'll happen within the next few cycles. However long it takes, it's ultimately all fragile within the scope of the universe. But perhaps that's just the way things have to be. By forfeiting familiarities, perhaps something new is gained. God, what a line. Just eight simple words that sum up the entire experience of Saints' campaign, huh? It's an experience that wouldn't be possible without forfeiting what's familiar, what's comfortable, what once seemed immutable. Much has changed since survivors first foray in the Pebbles facility. Too much has changed, perhaps. But out of that change is born a new experience that wouldn't be possible without it. Out of that change is born a new world for those that manage to survive its transformation. And the eternal echoes of the ancients will oversee that change as it unfolds. It's kind of messed up when you think about it, huh? How the echoes are just stuck here forever. And it's not just one echo, ten that we can meet. And that's just within this one facility. Who knows how many more are out there in the world at large? It's an eternal existence existence and yet one the ancients were willing to risk to escape from the cycle. A small risk, sure, but a risk nonetheless. What about the cycle drove them to such desperation that the risk was worth it? Well, <sighs> so this is where things get a bit more ambiguous because, well, the cycle as a concept is ambiguous, inconsistent, even within the context of the game itself. The cycle is an endless loop of death and rebirth, but in what way? When you die, do you go back in time to when you were born? Well, if that's the case, would that be a bad thing? A second chance at life of a clean slate? Who knows if you'd even grow into the person you were last time? Nah, that can't be it. Is it reincarnation in the Buddhist sense? Well, no, because the ancients never came back as something else, they came back as themselves, exactly. Each slug cat comes back as itself up until the last moment it woke, and anything that dies stays dead, even after a cycle passes. So, the only concrete details about the cycle we can really glean are what we observe in-game. You die, you go back to the start of the last cycle, you wake back up. Like, okay, it's possible that that's abstracting out literally every other cycle before the current one, assuming that it goes exactly the same as it did the first time, for the sake of gameplay convenience, but again, we don't see that. As far as I'm concerned, it's just a second shot at the cycle you perished in. They say sleep is the brother of death after all, and as such, waking up is a small birth, no? It works, as far as I'm concerned. And this interpretation is not really a problem for the Slugcats of Rainworld. Since death is always instantaneous, they wake back up in prime condition to tackle the cycle of what new knowledge they gleaned from their last death. They can still survive past that new cycle. So, what happens if someone can't survive past that new cycle? What if they fell victim to a disease they caught several cycles ago? What if they lose a long, torturous battle to cancer? What if their body just gives out from old age? Are they just stuck reliving that last cycle over and over again with no way out for the rest of eternity? Well, yes. Uh, don't mind me. Just picking up this pro for later. Anyways, suddenly, it makes a lot more sense why the ancients were so eager to gamble with their souls, huh? If you're given the choice between an eternity of dying over and over, or simply ceasing to exist with the off chance of an eternity of merely existing outside the cycle of life and death, the consequence of that risk is somehow less horrifying than letting your own fate play out. And on top of that, are the Echoes truly stuck here for eternity? Most of them are still right where we last saw them, sure, but the wall's Echo, six grains of gravel, has moved to the ruins of the lake following Pebbles' Collapse, and three previously unseen echoes have moved to familiar locations where no echoes used to be. But two echoes are missing. The downpour devs could have so easily reused the two missing echoes for Saint by moving them somewhere else like they did for Six Grains, and yet they didn't. Because they couldn't. Because they're gone. Oh, which two echoes you ask? Well, what places that used to exist no longer exist? Shaded Citadel and Metropolis, both reduced to rubble. Every echo is stuck here because they were tied to some part of the world. Four Needles was tied to their memories they'd left behind in the memory crypts. Twelve Beads was tied to the city they tried to escape, and the memories of those they left behind. Perhaps with the physical destruction of these places, so too were their memories destroyed, the last things binding them to the physical world, finally freeing their spirits after all these years. It's a nice thought, a glimmer of hope in this bleak world. I mean, 
mean, it makes sense, right? It's a great undoing. The old world will soon vanish, and that includes the last echoes of the ancients, until there is naught but silence, from which a new song can emerge. And thus, the final echo, who speaks with much more finality than any of the others before them. The echo who once spoke of such arrogance, such disdain for every civilization before their own, now humbled before the endless hunger of the void as they, too, vanish from history all the same as the rest. Except, this isn't the end, is it? Satan hasn't quite reached maximum karma yet. Well, there's only really two places that Lesico could be, and both of them are right next door, too. And it's not like Pipeyard served, well, any real purpose up until now. Let's try there first. Well, thanks for nothing then. Oh, Pipeyard, you sure do exist. Anyways, onwards to drainage then. Yet again, something new, something different. The dark, frightening atmosphere that used to permeate the lower trenches of drainage system is gone, replaced with a cozier darkness. A passageway that feels somehow alien, even by the rest of the world's standards. Giant mushrooms of the like we've never seen before, radiating a faint but comforting light. Crawling through tunnels, once inaccessible, now revealed by the collapse of pipes that were once flooded with rainwater. Seeing the telltale signs of that last echo, making the climb up to them, and... There they are, the echo that stands in defiance of everything the ancients stood for, really. In a culture obsessed with death, they instead chose life, became attached to the beauty of the world and to the life that inhabited it, attached to life itself. Honestly, their philosophy almost makes me doubt all my own theories about the ancients in the cycle because the combination of their sentience, of their awareness of the cosmic core of the cycle, and their optimistic, almost naive outlook towards it feels like a contradiction. But I like to believe it's less that and more that they were young enough to the cycle to not become as jaded by it as the rest. And yet, there's still quiet tragedy to their continued existence. They did not want to ascend like all the rest. They were forced to. Forced into death by the suicide cult that the ancients became at the end of their history. Forced into their eternal existence. And unlike the other Echoes, their attachment is not to any one place or structure, but to the very concept of life itself. And life persists even as the legacy of the ancients crumbles. Even if all the other Echoes might eventually move on, they never will. But you know, what? Maybe they're happy with that. Getting to watch the rest of history unfold, find joy in all the new life it brings, simply being content in the beauty of it all. It feels to me like they've reached a level of enlightenment beyond even what the ancients achieved. There's no need to pity that. Instead, let's move on and see the beauty they spoke of. <laughs> Undergrowth truly is breathtaking. In a world colored almost entirely in white, gray, and blue, it's so well green. Flourishing. It's the last true bastion of life in a world of death. All the creatures, all the plant life, they were all but extinct everywhere else in the world. They're all thriving here. Pole plants, drop bugs, monster cow, leeches, the gang's all here. You love to see it. You hate to see it too because, I mean, pole plants, drop wigs, monster cow, leeches, pests, a lot of them. But I can't help but appreciate their presence all the same. And and it's, well, what the Echoes have been talking about, what the entire campaign has been leading up to, a transformation. The cold, sterile, lifeless constructs of the ancients becoming an overgrown jungle. The world is not dying, it's simply becoming something new, something different. It's the end of Rain World, but the start of another. Another chapter in the ongoing story of the world. A story that was never about the slug cats, never about the iterators, never about the ancients, but about the world. But what if someone wanted to make it their story? <laughs> Thank you. I'll say goodbye soon. Though it's the end of the world, don't blame yourself now. And if
All right, I've avoided talking about it all this time, so Saint, what is Saint? Well, Rainworld's whole deal from pretty much the very start has been a very liberal reinterpretation of Buddhist philosophy. The cycle of life and death ascending to a higher plane of existence, i.e. Nirvana, it pretty much goes all the way down. In which case, Saint is Rainworld's Buddha, one who reached Nirvana, reached such a level of attunement so as to achieve ascension on their own terms, and yet rejected it in favor of staying in the world to help others reach enlightenment. I mean, that sleeve screen isn't exactly subtle about that intention now, is it? And now, having reached that highest level of attunement, Saint is ready to do what they came here for, help everyone else ascend, whether or not they want to. <laughs> Which isn't really all that different from the ancients, now is it? Would Saint have joined in the forceful ascension of rhinestones beneath shattered glass? Possibly. Honestly, as a player, it almost feels wrong to be given this kind of power. I don't want to disrupt the ecosystem via forced ascension, but Saint would. At the very least, it's hard not to use your newfound power in self-defense after spending so long completely defenseless, but it could also be used to help those seeking ascension on their own terms, right? <laughs> Right where we left him, still playing that same music pearl. Caught in his own cycle, having failed to solve the problem he was built to solve, having failed to ascend himself before his collapse, stranded in a ruin of his own creation, when all he ever wanted was a way out. And that's it. He's gone. For good. He's free of the cycle. Hell, even if Saint dies in response at the start of the same cycle, Pebble's Ascension doesn't get undone. He's no longer bound to the cycle, to any cycle. That's what Ascension truly is. That's what the Ancients were seeking. What? It's not like he needs it anymore. And I want my collection entry filled out. Heck off. Let's take it to Moon. We've got other business with her anyways. Right, that probably picked up earlier. That one first. You know, the first time I saw this Pearl's contents, I was kinda mad. At the end of everything, long past when every other written record the Ancients left has faded with the passage of time, this is the one that remains? An overwrought, overwritten message that basically boils down to our delivery of booze arrived? The most pompous, arrogant, and, well, useless of all the Pearls in the game? But the more I've had time to think about it, I kinda love that that's all that's left of the Ancients. The last trace of their existence is not but a testament to all their faults, to their monstrous egos. A testament to why the ancient time needed to end, why the world needed to move on from them. Move on from a civilization so self-centered that they destroy the environment just for the sake of solving their own problem and absolutely nobody else's. Yeah, the ancients were terrible and they deserve to be remembered as such. It's fitting. Anyways, the real reason we came here. The decision to ascend Pebbles was an easy one. He practically begged for it. It's what he devoted his entire life to. And in the state he was in, it was practically a mercy kill. Moon, on the other hand, well, she's never really shown any interest in solving the great problem. And if we ascend Center, we're undoing the rescue that Hunter gave its life for, the revival that Pebbles sacrificed himself for. Are we truly justified in, essentially, killing her? The old world and its relics should be allowed to finally rest. A new cycle is unfolding, one we need not be a part of. Maybe she just never had the guts to say it outright, but that last line more than implies that she wanted this too. Anyways, with the passing of the two gods, there's really only one thing left for us to do here.
Ah, uh, that's different. So much time has passed, so much of the world has sunk into the void sea that the depths are just gone. We're not even allowed the smallest familiarity. Well, not like we can turn back now. The discussion of Rubicon itself almost feels off topic, even for this rather unfocused stream of consciousness video. Like, it has basically nothing to do with the world as we know it. It's literally a dream, the game is upfront about that. There's no semblance of a coherent environment, no attempt at an ecosystem. It's a playground for Saint to use his ascension powers, a mashup level of the rest of the game, a last hurrah for the last campaign. Lore wise, it doesn't mean much. I may as well just skip over it to the very end. But I'm not going to do that, because there's one simple question about Rubicon that I think is worth discussing. If Rubicon is a dream, whose dream is it? I mean, it's not Saint's dream, that's the obvious answer, but the world being dreamed of here is nothing like the world Saint knows. Hell, there's parts of Rubicon taken from places that no longer even exist in the world Saint explores. No, those pieces, those places, are from the original Rain World, the world as it existed pre-downpour, the world the player is most familiar with. Rubicon is based on our memories, Rubicon is our dream. I mean, it's not like Saint wanted to come here anyways, Saint's mission is to help all living creatures ascend, it can't do that if it itself ascends, right? And this poses an interesting dilemma. Throughout the entirety of Rain World, one of the major focuses is to get the player into the role of each slug cat, to think like them, to act like them, to become them. Survivor simply finding its legs in this unfamiliar world. Artifice here becoming a violent monster that tears its way through the scavenger population. Reveal it, who all but ignores the world's ecosystem in the mad scramble for the nearest shelter. And likewise, in Saint's campaign, we try to become like Saint. The pacifist, too weak to throw spears, unable to consume meat, much more vulnerable to the harshness of the wildlife around it, but more mobile than any other slug cat before it, able to swiftly weave its way around danger by use of its tongue. And we follow Sand's goals, meeting all the echoes and reaching the maximum karma level. But after that point, our goal and Sand's goal diverge. We stop being Saint. Because we want an ending, we head towards where we expect to find one. But that's not what Saint wants. And yet, we drag Saint to the Rubicon anyways, against its will, based on our own experiences, our own expectations. So, naturally, the region is based on what we want. A long, difficult, satisfying conclusion to the gameplay loop that the original Rain World went out of its way to not have. Finding catharsis and using our ascension powers on all of the world's most fearsome creatures. Ascending a goddamn guardian, just because we can. The logical climax of Rain World as a video game. But to Saint, it's not a game. Saint didn't want to ascend because Saint has already ascended before we even took control of it. That's where the campaign starts after all. And yet, we imposed our own will onto Saint and brought it here anyways, in search of some conclusion to our game experience, when we could have simply just let things be as they were and move on. <laughs> At the very end of it all, past the strife, past the danger, past the last vestiges of familiarity, the world itself starts to break down and becomes more dreamlike than ever. The top branches of the great tree that is Rubicon, the physical space and the laws of physics falling apart as Saint floats to the top, to the same familiar room we've seen so many times, in so many different times. <laughs>
Here we encounter, for the final time, the two random gods we ascended. Now free of the cycle, free to muse about the nature of it. To consider death, really. Because we really don't know what lies on the other side of death. Everyone experiences it at some point in their lives, but nobody comes back from it to tell us about their experience. Because it's a one-way street. Not an endless cycle, a circle looping in on itself, but a line with a fixed beginning and end. And yet, Saint's own line is endless. speak to either iterator alone, and they comment not on their own plight, but upon saints. Not a circle, not a line, but an endless fractal spiral, one that continues infinitely even as it collides with other cycles. No matter how much you zoom in on it, its pattern endlessly repeats. And yet, in this endless dream where time does not exist, where time can be perceived from afar, Saint is still bound by time. Saint is an intruder in this dream, and so Saint cannot stay in it. Saint must wake up. So, paralleling every other slugcast descent into the void, Saint ascends from the other side of the void all the way up to cross back over that dividing line that no other soul has escaped from. Past the golden radiance of the void sea, past the infinite expanse of darkness, past the countless creatures swimming in the void. But when we reach where a curious void web would normally help aid in our journey to oblivion, Saint reminds us that we do not share the same will. And for the first and final time, control is taken away from the player as Saint rests the narrative back with its own power. What have you done, Saint? What have you done? As Saint's karma counts down, Saint's journey flashes by in reverse. No, not Saint's journey, your journey. Seen from your own memories, from the cycle you created for Saint. All of it being undone, fading away into the void. Turning back time, all the way to where your cycle and Saint's first intersected, and pulling those two circles apart to prevent them from meeting in the first place. And finally, outside of time, outside of space, in a vast sea not of darkness but of boundless light, with the pulsating sounds of reality collapsing in on itself, Saint crosses back over that point of no return, the same as the last lingering ancients did, by becoming an echo. An echo tied not to any one place, hell, not to any one time, not to life, death, or anything else, but to the cycle itself. A broken, misaligned circle that doesn't just stop, but keeps going, ever onwards, ever inwards, spiraling 
spiraling into eternity. To some extent, I almost suspect that Saint's entire campaign is all its dream from the moment it wakes up in Windswept Spires. A dream based on the world Saint left behind when it ascended, only to reject that ascension due to its attachment to the cycle. And so Saint dreams of a world where it had the agency to do something about that, to reach the highest level of attunement and help all other creatures ascend as well. Saint's ascension power is rather surreal anyways, like wish fulfillment for its own desires. A lucid dream to enact that its own fantasy in. A dream that becomes a dream within a dream, within a dream, within a dream, etc. One wonders if the other Echoes are all lost in their own dreams too, of the world they left behind. But the other Echoes may eventually move on, may eventually wake up from their dreams, as the monuments they built crumble. Even the Undergrowth Echo, tied to life itself, may eventually be freed if the life it overlooks fades away, but Saint? Saint can never move on, so long as the cycle continues in perpetuity. But you, the player, must move on. As we are given one last view above the clouds, a view completely hidden from us up until now, it really sinks in just how little of the world we know is left. The view that used to be dotted with iterators and towers as far as the eye could see now has so few left and all of them are crumbling into ruin. The age of the ancients and the iterators is over, a new world is dawning, one we need not witness. As everything comes full circle, Saint's cycle loops in at itself, parting ways of our own. You can't even continue your file, Saint has taken full control of its fate from here on out, so too must we let Rainworld itself come to an end. There's nothing more for us here. The cycle will repeat endlessly, but for us, it's time to move on, back to our own worlds, and let Entropy reclaim this one.